Welcome to Journeys with the No Schedule Man, exploring authentic stories of personal growth and lessons learned from people living true to themselves with creativity, passion, and purpose. For all past episodes, subscribe on iTunes or visit NoScheduleman.com. And please, connect, share, and contribute with a comment, rating, or review. And now, here's your host, the No Schedule Man, Kevin Ballmer. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any real mystery. The question this week is, do you sometimes feel trapped by love? On the surface, that seems like a paradoxical idea. But if you've ever been in a relationship with someone you feel you're supposed to love, when in fact you know deep down that it's really not a good situation for you, then you'll know what I mean when I say trapped by love. We're going to get into that with today's guest, along with some insights as to how you can set yourself free. Welcome, I'm Kevin Bulmer. This is Journeys with the No Schedule Man, helping to create positive change by exploring and sharing authentic conversations on personal and professional growth. You can find all the past episodes of this podcast anywhere in the world on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, and at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you're in the United States, you can find us on the U.S. feeds of iHeartRadio and Google Play Music. If you'd like to continue the conversation and have daily access to me, I'd invite you to join me In my online coaching community, it's called the Turtle Tribe. It's a place where you'll get daily positive support, some coaching hints and tips, a lot of encouragement, some empowering ideas, and creative collaboration from a group of like-minded people from literally all around the world. It's a membership-based community. There is a free seven-day trial, so you can make sure that it's a good fit for you. You'll find everything you need at theturtletribe.com. We'd love to have you. Now, back to where we started. Trapped by love. That's a phrase that came up in the conversation that you are about to hear with Pauline Duncan Thrasher. I was instantly intrigued by that notion. I know a lot of people who do, in fact, feel trapped in a bad relationship, maybe with their partners, maybe with their parents, their friends, their kids, I suppose, family members, co-workers, or even with their relationship with themselves. So... I have very little doubt that what Pauline has to share will be of great help to a lot of people. Pauline is a trainer, a coach, keynote speaker, and author who helps people to live, learn, and lead with love. It's her mission to help others believe in their own amazing selves. Pauline is the author of a book called Swimmin' Women, which features interviews with courageous women and three men who share secrets of how they learned to switch from fighting challenges of change to riding their waves of change. Now, this chat with Pauline, I felt like it was a really touching, thought-provoking, and quite frankly, fully transparent recounting of a story that will be very likely familiar to a great number of people, maybe even to you. We talked about, as I mentioned, being trapped by love, and how the beginning of real freedom and fulfillment is when you start to speak your authentic truth. Now, that sounds simple enough to say, but when you're in an environment where you don't feel safe and we don't feel there's an immediate place that you can turn to allow yourself to be heard, it can be a really lonely road. Hence the idea of being and feeling of being trapped. It takes a lot of strength and courage to finally allow yourself to grow through and beyond that. And that's exactly what Pauline has done. I also think it takes a lot of strength and courage to share those stories authentically and transparently and Pauline has done that as well as you're about to hear among the many things we discussed that really stood out to me in my time with Pauline included what I'll call the space between just get over it or what I might call suck it up you know when people say that to us or when we say that to ourselves the space between that and pity oh you poor thing oh life is so hard oh I can't believe that happened to you (laughs) neither one of those polar opposites is really, when you think about it, all that helpful. Well-meaning, though, the, the source of those phrases or ideas may be, but real compassion and understanding and what's really good for us probably lies somewhere in between. Just get over it. And, oh, poor thing. We get into that with Pauline. Listen for that. Number two, listening. 
and the healing that comes with feeling like you're being heard. Pauline's story about thinking that there were microphones in the room and then starting to say everything that she had bottled up inside her for all those years is really touching and revealing and I think necessary for us to hear. And whether you're in need of allowing yourself to be heard, to get your own thoughts and feelings out, or whether you're on the receiving end of that, I think it's important to understand the incredible power that listening provides. Sometimes it's our job as a loving partner, supporter, friend, coworker, child, parent, whatever the case might be. Sometimes it's our job to just shut our mouths and listen. And sometimes it's our job to say what we're terrified to let out so that it can be let out of us and trust the other party to listen and to hear us. We will probably do several episodes just on that. Number three, the irony of how traveling alone, in other words, being by yourself, can open up a whole world to you. That comes toward the end of our conversation. I hope this helps you or someone that you know or both. By all means, if you know of someone who's struggling a little bit with feeling like they've, they're in a safe space, that they can be heard and really be themselves, please do pass this along and let them know that there is hope. Here's Pauline Duncan Thrasher on Speaking Your Truth on Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Pauline, what comes to mind when I say, just get over it. You've got lots to be thankful for. <laughs> just get over it. I think at first, first hearing that, I think it's a phrase that is lacking in compassion, hmm. lacking in empathy. Perhaps I say that because... Some of the people I really care about have recently suffered um, emotional stress and physical stress. And to say, just get over it, you've got lots to be thankful for, is assuming that I'm inside their head, and I'm not. So, for example, there's a music director at, at my spiritual center that I attend, and I love this man. He is so kind, so caring, and yet he has early stages of Parkinson's. I would never, ever say, just get over it, because he's in the process of working it through himself. It's not up to me to say, just get over it. And if someone else said to him, just get over it, I'd give them a smack. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree that all of us have so much to be grateful for. When I was growing up, and I was sent to boarding school very early, uh, I was eight, my mother had not much patience with me crying when I left. And I sensed that she was saying, even if she didn't use the words, just get over it, you've got lots to be thankful for. So that's my response. I think that there is a danger for all of us personally speaking, of falling into victim mode. And that's a dangerous place to be when we start to feel sorry for ourselves, when we start to have the blinders on and all we can see is the agony in our lives or the lack in our lives. That's a dangerous place to be. And I try to encourage people to look outside that blinder, narrow vision. So I, I wouldn't say just get over it. I would encourage them to recognize their inside power. What do you remember about initially discovering the idea within yourself of questioning that idea? Like, for instance, you mentioned what you might hear from your mother. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about questioning that within yourself? I remember feeling angry. Um, I remember feeling 
shut out from the compassion I wanted. And that makes me sound like a victim. Because I was a child, I didn't recognize that for my mother it was probably as hard to send me away as it was for me to be sent away. But I do remember resenting the fact that she did not seem to understand why I was crying. And so she would tell me to stop crying. My aunt, on the other hand, who I adored, went in the opposite direction and would say, "Ah, oh, poor Pauline, which made me feel even sadder for myself. Mm. So I believe that there is such a tender, strong, compassionate way to deal with suffering people. And I believe that we learn that as we grow and suffer ourselves. We learn how to be with people who are suffering without making them feel like a victim, treating them as equals. I've been so impressed with the Paralympics and when I came, a I, long time ago, I went to Europe by myself, big journey. When I came back, soon after I came back, I was invited to MC. The that was like an equivalent of Paralympics here in the city. And to my astonishment and surprise, as I walked into the room, I saw the face of a former student. He was about 16, and I remember teaching him when he was about nine years old. And he had been rambunctious and wild and (laughs) really a handful for a teacher. (laughs) And now he was in a wheelchair. He was quadriplegic. And we looked at each other. I didn't quite know what to say but in that moment of looking at each other I still saw the rambunctious wild little boy he had been and I hope he saw some compassion from the teacher that I used to be for him at that games I made some friends and they remained friends for a few years until one of them moved away. And they were people who inspired me with their courage. And when I were watching yesterday a little bit of the sledge hockey, I'm a London Knights hockey fan, but it's a different feeling when you see young men in a little low sledge, low to the ground, and they are they are using their muscles and they're wheeling around that ice. They're being bold, courageous, and they're making the most of what they have. And I know that some of them used to be athletes. Some of them used to be full bodied, stand up, muscular athletes. And I know that one of them was speaking and he said, When I had my accident, I thought I will never be an athlete who's not full, full, full limbed, and yet now he is, and he loves it. He finds it exciting, rewarding, and I don't know if they realize how inspiring they are. So nobody has said to them, "Just get over it." They've said that to themselves, and so it's more powerful. Because they've come to a point where they are looking at life full in the face. And they're seeing who they are. And then their vision is expanding to who they can be, even in a broken body. I'd like to go back a few minutes to something that you observed, which I find really interesting. On one hand, you describe the just get over it and the lack of compassion that comes with (laughs) something like that. But then you also talked about your aunt and the, oh, poor Pauline, and how Mm -hmm. that's not what you really wanted either. And I would venture to guess that the Paralympians that you just described probably also would find that equally um, unhelpful. 
Oh, yes. Um, how would you describe what lies in the middle? What lies in the middle is a recognition that somebody's feeling badly or hurt or frightened. So it, it's a recognition of that feeling. It's an observation of that feeling. I can see that you feel really upset. So to observe the feeling without letting condescension or pity into your voice or into your feelings. To observe it and then maybe to say, I can see you rising above this. I now I'm a prayer chaplain. So when I do when I have a prayer with somebody who's suffering, I use the word I can see a lot. And as a prayer chaplain at Unity, I recognize and marvel at and I'm so filled with inspiring thoughts at all the powers that all of us have within us. And I just wish that someone had said it. Maybe I wasn't ready to hear it before. So I've been a prayer chaplain for five years now. And recognizing that no matter what the situation, no matter what, how horrible, how challenging, how devastating, we have within us the power to meet that, to deal with it. It doesn't mean that people don't suffer. And it doesn't mean that we say, get over it. But my thought is, we say, I recognize your suffering. I see that you're suffering. I believe that within you is a strength, uh, a faith, a courage to move beyond this. How can I help? Where along the line do you remember having this kind of dialogue with yourself for the first time, at least to some degree? I was in my early 30s. I was living with my mother. My mother was incredibly overprotective. And I recognized that both of us were suffering from depression. I felt trapped. I, trapped by love. I was the only person my mother had. So I didn't know what I could do. I didn't recognize what I could do. Prior to that, when I was about 28... I said to my mother, I need to see a psychiatrist. And she was horrified. <laughs> horrified because she came from a generation when seeing a psychiatrist was akin to wearing a big letter on your chest. Yeah, holding up a sign that says, I'm crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your head's going to be five times smaller on your shoulders when you come back. Exactly. I recognized that my life was not a normal life. I taught all day and I went home at night. I didn't have a social life. And when I became so depressed that I didn't even want to go to school to teach in June on sunny days, all I wanted to do was stay in bed. I knew something was wrong. So I recognized that I needed help to make a story a little shorter my mother did agree to drive me. I didn't drive. We were driving here in London, you know this, down, um, what's the street? Highbury. And there, there was at the time London Psychiatric Research, London Psychiatric was called the Highbury Hilton, scathingly. And as we got closer, my mother said, Pauline, duck down. I didn't have a clue what she was talking about. She meant crouch down in the car so nobody will see you as we drive in 
to the psychiatric hospital. Hmm. I did. Not because I was ashamed, but because I knew she was so upset and feeling all of her feelings. We went in. She wanted to go in with me to see the psychiatrist. The nurse said, well, no, she can go in by herself. I was 28. I went in. I sat, was talking to the psychiatrist. There was a little glass window behind where I was sitting. Sorry, it was behind him. So I could see out the window. And as I was talking to him about my mother and how I didn't know how to get my independence without abandoning her. I saw my mother's head in the window. And he saw my eyes move from his eyes to the window. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he turned around, and he said, we have to stop. He knew that it wasn't any point in going on because he couldn't help me because I was too connected with her, I guess. I don't know. He didn't say any of that, but we left. I didn't go back. The next time that I saw a psychiatrist was when I was 35, suffering a psychotic break, and I admitted myself to the psychiatric unit at University Hospital. So I know about uh, falling apart at the seams, I also know about holding yourself together so tightly that if if you were if you were a package and there was glue, the glue would be peeling out of the seams. It was probably my teaching that allowed me to stay pretty much together as long as I did. Um, my mother died in a psychiatric ward. Um, about a month after I went into the psych, not not a month, less than that. I went in in January, and she died on February 17th. So she had to be taken. So we were both in pretty bad shape, but I had gone that day to the hospital to get help for her. And when she found out that I'd done that, she was very angry. She didn't want help. She didn't want anybody knowing anything about our business. And if you can't reach out and ask for help, how can you get it? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was going to say I can't remember exactly what the original question was. <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> I think we were talking about the space between just get over it and pity. And I was going to come back to, anyway, and you've led us right back there, the idea about suffering. Mm -hmm. When you brought that up, Pauline, you were mentioning that in the context of people who had some sort of physical limitation, to put a, mm -hmm. a, a real broad generalization on what you were saying. I hope you'll forgive me f mm -hmm. for, for that, for the sake of the clarity of the discussion. And as I was listening to you, I thought, there are things that we perceive from which others are suffering. Yes. You know, that seem obvious, like, for instance, maybe a missing limb. Yes. They may not perceive that they're suffering. Mm -hmm. And yet, there are, I would venture to say, an equal and very likely greater number of us who appear as if everything's just fine, but are probably suffering at an even greater, deeper level. Oh, Yes that we, we don't even know about. And I suspect this is the sort of thing that you are you were just getting at a couple of moments ago. Yes, absolutely. And the front that your mother wanted to keep up. Mm -hmm. So the mask that people wear when they're suffering emotionally sometimes gets so tight that it's really hard to take it off. Especially when you don't know it's a mask. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Which is what fascinates me about how and where you were able to identify it as such. I did a lot of, uh, I 
I've always been an avid reader. I'm positive. You look around my office, you'll see the signs in the door and the slogans. I recognized when I was teaching that there was what I was teaching my students was way more than academics. I, I was teaching them to be positive. I took a course at Fanshawe College. It was a non-credit course in broadcast journalism, and we had a little video to make. And when I created my video, I borrowed different costumes. I borrowed a police uh, officer's uniform. I had to make big promises and sign papers and everything. I borrowed a nun's habit. And those are the two that stand out in my mind. And I was the star of my own video. And I was putting on different costumes. And so I had the insight to recognize that that's what I was doing in real life, too. Hmm. I was smiling and being polite, being a dedicated teacher. But inside, I felt as though my life wasn't whole, as though it wasn't, I was just living a little bit of life. I think, I think recognition comes maybe with prayer. I was a very fervent Catholic, and in some ways that helped me, and in other ways it didn't. That's a whole other discussion. But when I was in the hospital, I prayed because I felt totally alone, especially once I realized my mother had died. And I was very angry at my mother. Um, fortunately, I talked to her before she passed. But I never saw her after I left home. And that's, that's just what happened. That's a pretty devastating one-two punch in your mid-30s to have what you described as a psychotic break and then to lose your mother within four to six weeks, regardless of what mm -hmm. your relationship would have been with her at that time. Um, that feels heavy just to say it out loud, Pauline. Do you mind if I ask you what's a little bit more context to help people understand of what you mean by psychotic break? What was going on? The, this is what the doctors, when I read the coroner's report from my mother, and I didn't get that until many years after she died. Hmm. They referred to me as a spinster. I thought, oh, what a horrible name. But it was true. A spinster. I guess, well, I wasn't married. <laughs> I guess I was a spinster who was suffering a psychotic break. And what happened was that the day that that day, I went to see a lawyer in London, a very well-known lawyer, to ask if he would take care of my mother in case anything happened to me. I didn't know that anything was going to happen. I just knew that, I don't know, I get, it's hard to explain, but, and I asked him not to tell anybody. Then I went to the university hospital to see the doctor that my mother had. He's passed away. He also knew me. And I said, the same thing. In case anything happens to me, will you make sure my mother's okay? And when I was there, he said, well, can we check you out? Can we do uh, make sure you're okay? And I thought in my head, well, of course I'm okay. Why would they be checking me out? But they took my blood pressure and my temperature and my weight, and then they sent me down to the lunchroom and said, come back later. Hmm. While I was in the cafeteria, I remember this so vividly. I saw doctors and nurses in their uniforms walking around, and I believed, I truly believed, this is years ago, I believed that they were all watching me to make sure I was okay. They, they weren't, but I, I believed that. And then I went back upstairs, and I took a cab, I wanted to go back to school because I'd taken the day off school. I asked the cab driver to drive past our apartment. It was on Sheepside. And 
I knew when I was going by that it would never be the same for me. So I went to school. My principal, who is a bachelor, um, drove me home. I went in. My mother, somebody must have told my mother that I had gone to, that I told them that I was worried about her. And she slapped me. She'd never done that before, ever, ever. And I slapped her back, and we had a physical fight. And I remember being on the ground with her hands around my neck. And, I mean, it just says what awful shape she was in. Because she would never have done that normally, never. And I remember movies where people just pretended to th- they were unconscious. And so I went like that, and she let go. And I got up, and I said, I'm leaving. And she said, oh, Pauline, you can't leave. I said, I'm leaving. It was in January, and I went and I got my pillow out of my bed, and I walked out of the house and across the road to a phone. Now, when you think of that, that's not natural, but to me it was natural. To me, I was doing, I was taking care of me, really, for the first time, totally taking care of me. And then, well, I asked, I phoned a teacher that I knew. I said, I, I'm i in a phone booth, I need a ride. And she said, well, where do you need to go? I said, to Jim's house. That was my principal. Well, we were not, believe me, there was nothing romantic at all. But I just thought, well, he's my principal. Maybe that's the only place I can go. So she drove me. I said, first we have to go to the church. So she dropped me off at the church, and I told the priest that I couldn't come back anymore. And then she drove me to my principal's house, and there I was in January, standing on his doorstep, ringing his bell with my pillow. And he said, Pauline, what are you doing? And I said, I have to come in. He said, Pauline, you can't come in. I mean, principal in the Catholic school system single teacher with a pillow. You can picture it all. And I said, well, I have nowhere else to go. And I was being so insistent. That was not me at all, at all. Yeah. And, and he had two nephews who were going to university staying with him, so finally he did let me go in. And I just was doing what I felt I needed to do. And then he said, Uh, do you want to lie down? One of them brought me hot chocolate, I think. And so he led me upstairs and led me into a room, and I thought, gee, I can't sit on a man's bed. This this is awful. This would be sinful. So I sat on the floor. And he left. And then the next thing I knew, I heard footsteps coming up, and it was a doctor. So somebody had called a doctor. And the doctor said, would you like to go to the hospital? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, I think I would. So that's it. Um, It sounds like we could choose whichever analogy we want. The cup overflew, the dam broke, the... Did I just say overflew? (laughs) Overflowed? The cup overflew. (laughs) The dam broke, the straw that broke, whatever it was, something snapped. But it sounds to me like that had happened actually before you even got back in and saw your mother. You described Pauline going by the place. And I can't remember exactly the words that you used, but knowing that you were you were done, that that there was some chat that you you had just reached. When you say um, just get over it, I would say suck it up. Yeah. And there gets up to a point where you you, you just you can't. There, there, it, yeah, there's it, no space. There's, there's a complete system malfunction. Yes, and, and it sounds as if almost like you and your mother both reached the breaking point at the same time. Yeah. Um. Because what you're describing from after the the, the uh, I'll say confrontation with your mom 
almost sounds like a little bit of an out of body experience. Like your body mm. was going through this motion of arriving at the principal's house and sitting on the floor, yeah. and, but almost yeah. as if your spirit was somewhere else. And when I went to the hospital and they said, why, why are you coming in? I said, my feelings are worn out. Yeah. Hmm. So that was it. That was it exactly. And my feelings had been, maybe it's like brakes in a car that you use them and use them and use them and then they don't work anymore. Yeah. And so I was in the psychiatric ward for six weeks. And I had been there for about four weeks. And for the first few days, they put me in a room by myself. And I believed again, really believed that they had put microphones in the room as a broadcaster, you'd relate to this. Mm -hmm. And that it was so I could say all the things I wanted to say my whole life and didn't. All the things that had been kept inside. Anger at my mother, anger at my mother's boyfriend, um, anger about school, Mostly anger at my mother for the things that she kept me from, like my father over there, who looks like you, by the way. A little bit. She's pointing to a picture of her dad in the office we're in. Yeah. Very handsome fellow, if I may say. <laughs> <laughs> it's a black and white picture. Wouldn't it be great if we could put some purple on him? You'd yeah. like that, huh? Yeah, he's in his officer's uniform. Um. I forget what I was saying. Well, you were letting everything out, convinced that the microphones were picking you up, but still. So I talked for, I don't know how many days they left me in that private room. And I believe that they had microphones so that I would feel free to talk. And and it was um, cathartic, I'm sure, even though there was no human being in front of me. And then finally, I did talk and talk and talk and talk to a real psychiatrist and because university hospital is a teaching hospital they would ask did I mind speaking to residents I didn't mind talking to anybody it was like the dam had burst isn't it interesting that uh or your cup over flew (laughs) (laughs) my cup over flew (laughs) isn't it interesting that you perceived that you could or should talk because you had convinced yourself there were microphones. Yes. I wonder if maybe there was some subconscious element of even just thinking he, the, the microphones were almost ears. Here now I can finally be heard. Yes. Yes. There's something to listen. Exactly. That's it. That somebody was listening and nobody was saying, all right, there, that's en- you've said enough. Nobody was saying how to speak or when to speak or when to stop speaking. And that's such that was such a gift to me. And really, in real life, isn't it the biggest gift that we can give to people to listen to them? I was divorced after almost 12 years. She got into another relationship. We're all fabulous friends. I'm very proud of that. One of the things I only discovered from going through that process and the time since was that sometimes it's not my job to fix. Most times it's not my (laughs) job to fix. And you can insert whatever cliche or analogy, especially about men, that that you want here. Mm -hmm. That sometimes it's it's just to listen. And that's one thing that I know that I didn't know how to do in, in that marriage and in the relationship I'm so blessed to enjoy now. It, it takes work, Pauline. Oh, I know. <laughs> Where uh, yeah. sometimes she'll start to relate something and I can feel myself wanting to, <laughs> because we want to help. This gets back to where we started about... Uh, men and women. Yeah. Well, there's men and women, but there's also, you know, that line between suck it up and oh, poor thing, but meeting it with something meaningful in the middle that sometimes it doesn't need to be met with anything but an ear. I'll have a, a little voice inside my head screaming at me that says, just be quiet. Just listen. Just yeah. listen. <laughs> Don't say anything. Why do you think that's so hard for us? 
I think men are trained as little boys to be strong. They're trained in the idea that they are the big protectors in the world. And not that that's awful, but if you're the big protector, who are you going to protect? And my husband and I did a workshop once, and we will do, I keep saying to him, we need to do it again. It was about the different ways that men and women communicate with each other. Mm-hmm. And I think women nurture and men protect. But that was that doesn't have to just be all men protect and all women nurture. Men can nurture too, and women can protect also. So I think sometimes if you love someone, often if you love someone, probably always if you love someone, you want the best for them. So you want to come up with answers. And yet my women friends and I have often said, it's easier sometimes to talk about problems to a woman friend because she doesn't always come up with answers. She just listens. And yet the men that are the most special, if any man is listening to this and he wants a relationship built on mutual trust and mutual love, he needs to learn how to just listen And he can say, is there any way I can help? And she might say, no, just listen. You listening is the biggest gift you can give me. So I, I don't know why. I think we can do a big disservice to our boys when they are young in telling them, don't cry, be strong. Because then they learn to mask their feelings. And girls can cry. If I say can cry and get away with it, this is going to be on your podcast. It sounds so horrible, but hopefully people will understand what I mean. Girls can cry and people will say, aw, that's okay. But if a boy cries, what will they say? Be a man. Little boys don't cry. Why shouldn't they be allowed to cry too? doesn't mean you want people to fall into a puddle of tears, anybody, boys or girls. I think people just need to know that, as I said before, we acknowledge your feelings. We can see that you're upset. Is there some way I can help? I took a course. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. Now she's Sorry. gone looking around the room. <laughs> um, I just recently took a course in crucial conversations, and it was the best course. Our retired minister taught it, and and it was perfect because it was a, a little bit about what you and I have been talking about, Kevin. It was about um, observing. And engaging in conversations when the stakes are high. And that takes a lot of skill. And and because I'm a communicator and what I do is help people to communicate more effectively, this course was so right on. And there were questions in the course that were difficult to answer about communicating and about communicating with the people we really care about and doing that openly and honestly. And that sounds easy, but it's not always easy. No, I feel very strongly that we get a foundation of reading, writing, arithmetic, which is necessary, but that we're never equipped to know how to effectively communicate with other human beings up to and including ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons why we don't do that is because we don't know how. (laughs) <laughs> or there aren't there aren't enough of us, yeah. but I think that will change as as the generations do. I, I hope so. But along those lines, if we can go back a few minutes in the conversation, where you are talking to microphones, more than that, feeling as if you're being heard and getting some mm-hmm. things out that had been left unsaid. 
a lot of anger and a lot of, I'm assuming here, Pauline, um, really abrasive emotion, anger mixed with grief once you've lost your mother. And I'm going to see if I can skip a few steps to answer two or three questions in one. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) Only because I think you're up to it. By asking you about where, first of all, what Swim and Women is. Okay. And and maybe where that finally came from for you. Swim and Women is the first book I've written, whole book. I wrote it as a tribute to my mother. I shouldn't say as a tribute. I dedicated it to my mother because even though... I was angry, and even though she was so hurting herself, I owe a lot of who I am to my mother. So Swim and Women is interviews with many women and a few men who've overcome big challenges in their lives, and they share how they did that. It's partly autobiographical, so I do talk about my mother, There are pictures of my mother and me in the book. The cover. (laughs) She wants to go wandering again. Next time I interview (laughs) Pauline, I'm going to hook her up with a wireless clip-on mic so that you can wander around. The cover is my mother as a young, beautiful woman and me as a child, and we were in Bayfield. So I wrote it because... I wanted to get a lot of my feelings on paper because I love writing. And I I wanted it for her. But I also wanted it for any women who go through big, big challenges who need to know how to get through life. So swimming women is not, although my mother loved to swim and she taught me to swim, it's about how do we make our way through life And when the waves are high, do we dive in or do we stay on shore and say, oh, no, no, I'm so scared. But those lucky people are out there swimming. Aren't they lucky? No, we don't. We dive in. So it's ride the waves of change and dive into life. And so at the end of every chapter, I put down some ideas, some strategies. How can you ride the waves of change? You can't stop the water from having waves, and you can't stop life from having change. You and I are changing right now. Mm -hmm. And, and, And we can't stop the change. So how do we deal with it? How do we learn to embrace it and grow from it and flourish from it? Ride the waves of change and dive into life. And so I do talk about falling apart. Um, in the book and getting back together and I interviewed some well-known women Hazel McCallion the mayor of Mississauga who was the mayor of Mississauga and David Patchell Evans who is the founder of Good Life and I interviewed other people who are not so well-known and some of the people I interviewed are no longer here my friend Sue my cousin Roger. Um, my cousin Roger took his own life the year that my book was published. I had just gone over to the store with the bare, uh, the fresh copy, and and the first copy, the original copy, had a picture of Roger and me on the back. We were very very close. I put it in the mailbox. M- my husband drove up and said. Hop in, Pauline. We were only a few blocks from the post off the postal station, and I knew something was wrong as soon as I saw him. And the police had called to say that my cousin had died. So I talk about Roger in the book, but when I talk about him, he was still alive. And um, so my next book will be more about men than women. There will be some women in it, but I think men deserve 
a bigger shape today. They deserve more fairness. They deserve to be recognized. The really decent, good men deserve women to stand up and say, all men aren't horrible. There are good, wonderful men out there. And there are brave men out there. And there are men with integrity. So I've already interviewed three. One was Jake, my music director. Hmm. Um, So that will be a book about men being courageous and men being decent and men making a change in the lives of the people around them. And we need, I think, today more than ever to look at people and see the face of God in everyone we see. To really see something special, unique, and wonderful. Because there's so much cynicism out there and so much fear, so much anger. So we need to celebrate the good. What did um, that project in the time since, what's that done to your perception of Perception of isn't what I want to say, I don't think, Pauline. Of how you feel about your relationship and uh, with your mother and the memory of your mother. The book gave me a lot of insight. It dissipated my anger. It took away my anger. Why do you think that is? Because, because as I was writing, I was remembering the good times mm. and the laughter. And I was also writing about other women who had struggled, who had challenges. And I was recognizing that I was given so much more growing up than my mother was. And I was given tools that helped me to be strong. And being with somebody who I could feel her and see her falling apart. And her falling apart was so clear, but she didn't have what I had to help me. So she didn't make it, and I did. When I say make it, she died having a seizure in a psychiatric ward. And I was able to leave the psychiatric ward and receive extra help at a group called Marimna and go back to teaching right after spring break and to feel supported outside and inside. And so being aware of my own strength also made me aware that my strength wasn't just given to me in a handful A lot of my strength came because my mother made a lot of sacrifices and because she did the best she could for who she was when she was. And that allowed me... I I recognized that while I was writing. Writing is very... um, It's therapeutic because it's a conduit to our emotions and and I couldn't write without thinking back to a lot of things that had happened trying to choose between (laughs) a couple of different avenues I'll go with this one where did Pauline Duncan Thrasher begin to celebrate being amazingly her or put another way (laughs) at what point along the line was amazingly you brought into some form of existence well amazingly you came into existence before the phrase amazingly you Mm -hmm. that doesn't surprise me i think it probably came interestingly enough when i was in the hospital really yes 
But I didn't, of course, I didn't recognize it yet. But when I left the hospital, even when I was in the hospital, I was, because I was speaking what I wanted to say, Mm -hmm. and just sharing my feelings, that's the beginning. That's the beginning for anybody. When you recognize that, first of all, you, you have feelings, you mm-hmm. have thoughts, you have the right to say them, you have the right to share them. It's wonderful if somebody's there to listen. When I went home and I went back to our same apartment where we had lived, and that was very, very hard, because I, my, I could smell my mother's perfume. And um, so it was very difficult for me to go back to the apartment. But I started as soon as I went back to live by myself. And it took time, but I began to feel free for the first time in my life. Free to do what I chose to do. So I went to Mexico by myself at spring break. (laughs) Not that spring break. I mean, (laughs) not that one. Um, But that summer, I went out to Vancouver by myself. My cousin Roger was out there with his girlfriend. And I flew out by myself and did some traveling around by myself. I don't think anybody can, well, maybe somebody out there has a very, 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 very protective parent who tells you when you're going downtown and you're a grown-up, phone me when you get downtown to make sure you're okay. Phone me when you're on your way home. I'll drop you off at school. I'll pick you up at the end of the day. Not school where you're a student, school where you're a teacher. I will go in and talk to your principal and make sure he's treating you well when you're a teacher. So my mother, when I say, protective when I say helicopter parent I can't say it enough so although I desperately missed my mother I felt I knew that I had to stand on my own feet and there was a freedom there was a glory in that a liberation in that that's when I started to realize wow my goodness This is me, and I can choose what I want to do. It didn't happen overnight. Please don't think it did, anybody who's listening to this, including you. But it did happen, and it began in the hospital. And then trips. um, Vancouver that summer, Mexico the following spring, a fascinating trip to Key Cocker in Honduras with a man. First time I'd ever gone anywhere alone with a man. Um, Six weeks of scuba diving. And it wasn't that I always felt confident. I didn't. But I felt excited to be alive. I felt thrilled to be alive. And... Then, in 1979, choosing to go to Europe, 1978, the summer of 78, by myself, for an unlimited length of time. And people said to me, wow, you're so brave. I said, I've always wanted to go to Europe, and nothing would hold me back. And I was seeing somebody that I was very, thought I was in love with. And he said, I might not be here when you get back. And I said, I have to go. And I had to. I had to answer that call to be on a wonderful adventure. And I did, and I'm so happy I did. To be amazingly you. Yes. Isn't it an interesting irony? Funny to me, Pauline, how many truths really seem paradoxical from what we think they are. So in this case, because I've done nowhere near the traveling that you've described, 
but I do love going places by myself. Yeah, I like having good company as well and celebrating experiences with the people that I love, of course. But I love traveling and being on my own. And the irony I see of it, and I'm hearing in your story, is how bringing it down to something singular, like just being alone, paradoxically, tends to open you up. Yes. To so many other people and experiences. Oh, it did. I met way more people by myself than I would have if I'd been traveling with a girlfriend or yeah, isn't even that a guy. In- interesting. Fascinating, isn't it? It is fascinating. And yet we yeah. hear, how could you ever be by, you know, air quotes, by yourself? Well, maybe that's the gateway to really opening the world up to you. I think so. Which brings us to amazingly... You and the way that you are able to connect with people now, how would you describe what it is that you love most to do these days? I really love to mentor people. I love to speak. So I speak at my at the spiritual center that I belong to once a month. Hmm. When I'm speaking, I'm connecting. So it's connecting with people in a way that will inspire them, will motivate them to be more of who they can be. I recently mentored a young fellow from Lebanon who's, who's in my Toastmasters club. And we met and he said, shared how nervous he is about impromptu speaking. And I said, you can do this. I know you can do this. So... Two weeks ago, we had a debate. I was the debate chairperson. Nobody knew the topics except me. He didn't do the first one. He didn't do the second one. I was looking at him saying, I won't use his name because I should respect his privacy. I looked at him and I said, you're going to do the next one, aren't you? He did. And he was so thrilled. And I was so thrilled. So I love helping people to really see that they are amazing to really uncover their potential, whether it's as speakers. Uh, um, I spoke at our Women in Business on Tuesday, and and the theme was, I my theme was just how do you how you how do you get onto a path of personal power, Mm. not with fists in the air pounding people down, but your own. How do you discover your own personal power, and. Not the King Kong. Method, huh? <laughs> no, not okay. the King Kong. So um, that, that was good, and I, I felt good about the talk. And then someone in the room asked me to come and speak to her, and she was with a friend, and the friend was feeling, I could tell that she was just so sad and so devastated, and she had had a personal tragedy the week before. I'd never met this person, and I talked to her, I prayed with her, not Hail Mary, not Our Father, not that kind of prayer, the kind of prayer I talked to you about before where I I was with her and I listened and I said, you have something within you. You have a core of strength within you. And I can see you tapping into that core of strength. And we, I spoke with her probably for, I don't know how long, maybe five or ten minutes. And I hugged her, and she felt good. She felt better. She didn't feel good, but she was grateful that I had listened and that I was sharing, and that's what I really love to do. Um, To be there when somebody needs whatever I have to offer. Um... To remind people that they have way more than they recognize. Way more. That it's it's as though there's a treasure inside. We go through life, I mean, here I am a senior and and it's taken me all these years still discovering not just what I have, but what other people have. And helping them to believe in themselves. And I coached someone a little bit last week who was going to do a presentation on Sunday, and she was nervous. And I said, be yourself. 
be your authentic you. And she was. And it wasn't just because of my coaching. Her husband coached her a lot too. But she was authentic. And to say to people, be who you really are, that's a gift. That makes me feel great <laughs> to be able to do that. It's my guess that you have gone a long way to helping anybody that's still with us and, and listening to this here today, Pauline, because I think that anytime we can step forward to, to share what's real, you know, we can the label that we slap on this is vulnerability. That's yeah. a sugar-coated way of just saying, just being real, <laughs> in yeah. my opinion, and being yeah. human. And yet we still seem to be at the point of, in our evolution where uh, it, it, it takes some effort and courage to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And I consider it a great honor when I get to share the company of, of people that will, will do that along with me and, and hope that it helps oh. somebody else. I'm sure it will. And I want to thank you so much for, uh, for this time. It's, uh, it's oh. wonderful to get to know you better. And thank you so much for sharing some of your Oh, story. you're welcome, Kevin. It was a pleasure. To connect with Pauline, you can reach her on her website. It's www.amazinglyu. Dot com. You is in Y-O-U. And yes, there are two Y's in there. Amazingly you, all one word, dot com. Of course, I'll have that link up on the show notes blog post at noschedulemanpodcast.com for this episode, which is number 72. You can also find Pauline on LinkedIn. And if you're on Facebook, look for her page at facebook.com slash amazingly you. And again, I'll have those Links uh, up with episode 72 in the blog post at noschedulemanpodcast.com. If you liked this episode, I'm quite sure that you're going to like last week's episode, number 71 with Katie Kozlowski on finding the courage to tell your story. There are a lot of parallels between what Pauline had to share and what Katie shared with us in episode 71. Episode 61 also came to mind with Kevin O'Hara from Alcohol Mastery. That was called How to Change Lives by Being Yourself. That's episode number 61. And the other one that immediately came to mind, I'm going to recommend you go all the way back to episode 12. And Jason Stevenson, who runs my favorite guided meditation and sleep music channel on all of YouTube, absolutely love Jason's work, and I'm still tickled that I got to talk to him. That particular episode was called The Power, or excuse me, The Spirit of Giving and the Power to Change. The Spirit of Giving and the Power to Change from Jason Stevenson, an incredible story of transformation, and you can hear that in episode 12. You can find those in all past episodes of this podcast anywhere around the world on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or at noschedulemanpodcast.com. And if you're in the United States, you can also choose from the U.S. feeds of iHeartRadio and Google Play Music. If you'd like to connect with me, I'd love that. Just look for No Schedule Man. That's my handle on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. You can visit me at kevinbolmer.com or noschedulemancom We'll take you to the same place. And once you're there, you can learn more about my speaking, coaching, interactive workshops, boot camps, and other content there. And again, a reminder to be part of my online coaching community. Visit me at theturtletribe.com. Would love to have you. Thanks again for spending this time with me. If you found this helpful, please do subscribe and tell a friend. I hope to have you here again for the next episode of Journeys with the No Schedule Man. Just a little deja vu.